Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for your gift of fellowship, for your establishment of the local church, and for the obedience of your people to gather together. Lord, we know that in the book of Hebrews, it commends to us that principle, and that particular church and that particular people was under the severe persecution of the land. And we don't find ourselves in that position today, not yet at least. There might be some verbal things said and some animosity in some circles of our culture, but Lord, it is not against the law to gather. And so I thank you for those who willingly this morning were faithful to rise and to prepare themselves and to set aside time to be obedient to what the Word of God says, to come together. To find the Sabbath day to be a day of rest and a day where we, Lord, receive the Word of God. Where we fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. And I pray that your rich blessings would be upon your people who have walked in obedience this morning. I thank you, Lord, for the way in which you have guided the service to this point. Lord, and I pray that as we open your Word this morning, that we would be instructed from your Word and that your Holy Spirit would illuminate our hearts, and that, Lord, that which is said would be profitable, Lord, it would be right, Lord, that we would be taught, that, Lord, we would indeed be reproved, that we would be corrected, that we would be trained in righteousness. For this is the purpose of your word, so that your people might come to maturity, so that we might be useful tools in your hands, and so that we might become more and more like our Savior. Or that we might find this will of yours, our sanctification, to be a glorious joy. Or as we are refined, oftentimes in the fires of adversity, but Lord, as we are refined in the mirror of your word, as we see those things which expose us, and we see those things which correct us, and we, Lord, don't shy away from truth, but we come to truth and say, yes, let it be so in my heart. And let it be so in my life. And let the evil that is still reigning within me at times and wars against the new man, may it be gone as the word of God comes to bear upon us. So thank you for that which you've already accomplished in these days. Thank you for the history of this church and the commitment to the word of God. And we pray this morning that that tradition would continue as your word is taught in Jesus' name. Amen. As we've left the peaks of Resurrection Sunday, I began to think of what do we do from here? Where do we go from here? Last week, we had a wonderful journey through 1 Corinthians 15, and we considered the beauty of resurrection, the truth of resurrection, the, the comfort of resurrection, the majesty of what Christ has accomplished, that death is swallowed up in victory, that death has lost its sting and the sting has gone because of Christ and his absorption of it. But where do we go? Our sovereign Savior is in heaven, as Pastor Mitch taught us last week. And we revel in the glorious accomplishments that he has. We thank God for the work of salvation that he has brought to us. That his perfect life and his sacrificial death and his resurrection is that which brings us to truth. And brings us to right living. But we await his soon return. We await his promised return. We await the moment when the Father says, go, and he comes to take us home. But as we've said before, we thank God for the pause because it gives us opportunity to be faithful. And so what do we do in the pause? What do we do in the faithful moments? How can we be found faithful as the word commends to us? Holding your finger in 2 Corinthians, just if you can, flip back probably a page at the most two to the last verse where we left off last week, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58. Paul says this, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. He leaves the peaks of resurrection truth and he finishes with that sentence, and he commends to his hearers and to the church at Corinth and others along the ages and crosswalk today and individually our lives to be steadfast and immovable and always abounding. 
Many times we wonder, what is our purpose in life? The Word of God makes it abundantly clear countless times if we would only give ourselves to it, to believing it, and to obeying it, to seeking the Lord's grace in the moments of failure and His strength that we might be faithful in it. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we pick back up there and we find ourselves searching for the question, what do we do then from the peak of resurrection, from the work of Christ to save us? And I would love to give a history of 2 Corinthians this morning, but I'm not going to for the sake of time. There are tremendous study resources available to you, and I hope that when you read through the Word of God, you take the time to look at those sections, to consider the history of the author and the audience and the times. It's expository studying is what it is, so that you might be equipped to know who in the world was Paul talking about, so that we might be careful to be faithful to the context, and we might be faithful not to apply things out of context. Two books that I've been reading recently, one called Christian Formation, the other Nine Marks of a Healthy Church by Mark Dever, both rich, rich books, um, have been so helpful to me to remind me of truth, to remind me of the reason that we exist in the primary calling of the church to teach the Word of God. We're here for instruction, we're here for fellowship, we're here for service to one another, and I pray for that almost every Sunday on the ride here from Port Orange to pray that God would help us then to be instructed, to enjoy the fellowship that we have, and to be able to serve one another here, but to go forward in all those things, that we might grow in the instruction that we have, that we might fellowship in the days ahead, that we might serve one another, and it is a rich joy to see that taking place. But Paul instructs us here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and where do we go from here? And so I'm going to read the chapter, and then we will work through the chapter in section by section. He says, and think about this in the terms of what we heard last week. Don't forget we just left the resurrection chapter of 2 Corinthians 15, and now we're jumping here into the middle of 2 Corinthians, but nonetheless a great point to come to. He says, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put, our heavenly, put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So, whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance, and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who might live no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer." Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. All this is from God, 
who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, Christ, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting our trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, making his appeal through us. We implore you on his behalf, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and we thank God for these words. In the very first section here, the verses 1 through 5, Paul is found to be confident of what he has already talked about in his previous letter of 1 Corinthians. And it's important to note that he doesn't write these letters back to back. Uh, There is a period of time, in fact, there's either three or four letters that were written to Corinth, two of which we have in our Bibles today. But it's important for us to remember that what Paul says, he says to the church there, it is important for the context to understand, but it does make its way to us today. And Paul is confident that while in this body, and this body certainly has its many difficult times. Look at that first one. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building for God, from God. So Paul is confident that while this body will surely fail, and death is certain, absent from Christ's first return, he has nothing to fear because God has prepared for himself, or for his people, an eternal and everlasting heavenly body. I appreciate what one translation that says, for we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, when we die and leave these bodies, we will have a home in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. There's comfort in that. There's comfort in that for many reasons. We live in a day filled with just all manner of tragedy and difficulty, physically speaking. And so Paul is confident in the fact that although the flesh may fail, we have a guarantee, and that is from God. Our groanings in this life, while difficult and hard and full of all manner of tears, they serve to fill us with confidence that the groanings point to the heavenly promise, which again was covered in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 53 through 55 last week. Do we not all fear death from time to time? Absolutely, but we have no need to fear death because we have the assurance, as Paul says, that even though the earthly tent is destroyed, taken down, done away with, we have been given and already have in store for us and waiting for us a heavenly body provided for us by God. That should give us courage to run the race, to be faithful, to do whatever it is that God's called us to do, no matter the task. That does not make it easy, but it does make it where we can walk in truth. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth, Jesus said in his high priestly prayer. And we need to have truth so that we might know, yes, this is difficult. This is hard. This is overwhelming. I don't know what to do, but God is faithful. He's promised me everlasting rest. And in the meantime, whatever days I have on this earth, they are days prepared for him to be of service in whatever he would direct us to. Our confidence rests in God who has promised us that we have eternal life. That not only do we have eternal life, but we have an eternal body that will be ready for us upon our departure from this world. And also that we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, he who has prepared for us this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Paul also mentions the guarantee of the Spirit in relation to salvation and our eternal life in Ephesians chapter 1. Dr. MacArthur refers to that as a way of saying a down payment. It is an assurance. It is a gift given to us saying this is the beginning of all that you will have. And boy, what a beginning it is that we would receive the Holy Spirit as our own to live in us, to prepare us for eternity and to give us a purpose now. The the Holy Spirit is a guarantee of our faith. It is a guarantee of our eternity. It is the promise that we have from God. It is one that we can count on. 
I don't know about you, but I relish the promises of God. I lean upon the promises of God when difficult times come. And I'll tell you, the last four, three weeks have been some of the most difficult that I've ever faced, not being my own physical body. What am I to do but cling to Scripture? What am I to do but call upon the Lord to say, I need your grace, we need your help, but we have your promise. So we stand confident that while we are physically washing and wasting away, we hate that, don't we? There's every kind of aisle available in the store to, to wipe away wrinkles, to, to bring re rejuvenation of life. And I'm thankful that we love life. Humans love life. We love to live. We do everything we can do. And even when we mentally might be weak, our bodies refuse to give up. They still press on until that moment that they have no strength left in them and they have to give up. But all flesh is that way. So we stand confident that while our flesh is wasting away, there is hope, there is a guaranteed promise of these eternal bodies that have been fit for us, that have been prepared for us, that have a purpose for the eternal ages to come. So what hope is ours then in a world filled with physical pain and calamity? Sin's consequences ravage the body and they ravage humanity. They produce all kinds of grief, and yet we have hope. Yet we have hope. Yet we can trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not to our own understanding, acknowledging Him in all of our ways, knowing that He'll direct our path. Paul urges us then to courageous living. Look at verse 6 and following. So we always are of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we are a good courage and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in his body, whether good or evil. As a result of God's spirit dwelling in us, we can be men and women of great courage. Again, in a world filled with all manner of fear, fear is on the rise because of the hopelessness of cultures, because of the lack of promise and assurance. What promise does the atheist have? What assurance does the person who goes about filling his life with every manner of pleasure have when the pleasures waste away, when the purpose for living is gone, when the ideas and the worldviews come to bear on their life and they fall miserably short of the Christian perspective? and God's will in our lives. Not so for Christians. It ought to be a light in a dark place. We expel darkness because the light of truth comes in and says, we are of good courage, always of good courage. Paul, always of good courage? Do we know his history? Are we aware of his struggles? Would we compare ourselves to him? And some did. Some tried to, to put Paul down and to demoralize him and to make fun of him and to ruin his name. But he was Christ's. He was the slave of Christ. He was hidden in Christ. He was not done away with by their threats. And we can't either. All the men would rail against us and say all manner of evil against us and our God. Who has assurance? Them or us? Who has the promise of eternal life? Them or us? Who will find themselves in glory on that day? Themselves or us? So let them say what they would say. Always be of good courage. Now can I say and can we say we're always of good courage? Again, thinking of Paul's suffering, turn over just one page to 2 Corinthians 6. We'll look at just a few of these things. Here's Paul, verse 4 talking in the plural, but as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love. By truthful speech and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness, for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise. We are treated as impostors and yet are true. And he continues on. Always rejoicing. Always courageous. Always 
faithful. Paul was not perfect, but he was filled with the same Holy Spirit that you and I have. And we are empowered by the same Spirit to walk in the same way. Maybe not to do the same things. Certainly not to do the same things. But it's so interesting to me that so often people want to say, let's be like the church of Acts. Okay, read the rest of Acts. Read the difficult times that Paul faced. Are we willing to face that? Do we want riots in the streets because we proclaim Christ? If that's what the Lord brings, then so be it. But let us be faithful and true to his word. And let us be like those who have gone before us. The godly heritage that we have, the godly men who've gone ahead, and those women who have been faithful in spite of death, they are of good courage. For why do we have good courage? Because we know it doesn't matter. If I'm here in the pulpit or if I'm in the grave, I will either be here and useful to him or there and in his glory and useful to him there. Why? Verse 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We're not only saved and justified by faith alone, we walk by faith alone. Oh, that we would walk by faith alone. Oh, that our confidence can be in Him. And oh, the challenges that we face in life when difficulties do arise and, it's, and the fires come up under our feet and, and the dross comes to the top and we realize, oh, I don't walk by faith, do I? Oh, so many times I don't walk in truth. Oh, so many times I am walking by sight. I'm overwhelmed by the evidence around us that the world is full of all manner of difficulties. True, but the Creator has done all that He has done so that He might bring about newness of life. And that's where Paul is heading in a moment. So we walk by faith and not by sight. We encourage one another to walk by faith and not by sight. When the difficulty comes, we come alongside. We weep with those who weep. We rejoice with those who rejoice. And we encourage them to walk focused on Christ alone, who went to the cross, who rose from the grave, who is in heaven now interceding us, interceding for us at the right hand of God. So that we might be faithful. So that we might make it all the way. So that we can persevere and not defect. We're either going to defect to death or we're going to persevere to life. And that will come through the work of the Holy Spirit. And it will come as we walk by faith and not by sight. And the testimony to the world is remarkable. So he again says, yes, we are of good courage and we would rather be away from the body. When we know the glories of heaven, we know what we have promised in store for us. Why not desire heaven's gates? And the Lord's everlasting presence. But we humble ourselves again as slaves of God, as servants of the Most High, to say, wherever you would have me to be, I'll be faithful. Whatever you have me to do, I'll do it. Not in my own strength, but in your strength. Because my weakness is great, but your strength is greater. And in my weakness, he is made strong. And his power perfected. And glory belongs to him alone. So whether we at home or away, what does Paul say? We make it our aim to please him. Maybe that should be hanging over our door when we leave in the morning. My aim, to please him. Whatever the day holds, to please him. Whoever comes into my life, to please him. Think about the word of God that commends to us the life of Christ in the Gospels. I mean, we're not perfect, Christ alone being perfect, but he was perfect because he was obedient. It wasn't that he tapped into his godness and said, okay, I'm going to be perfect through that. He walked in obedience because he was faithful to truth. He loved truth and he walked in the power of the Spirit, fully yielded to his Father that he might be righteous for us. And when he was weak, he went to the Lord. And when he made decisions, he prayed all night long. And when the crowds pressed, he had compassion. This is what it is to be like Christ. This is what it is to be made in his image. That when the world presses on us, that compassion flows out. We aim, make it our aim to please him. Where would you lead me this day, Lord? Lord. Where would you lead me this day, Master? So many want to have the gift of eternal life. They don't want to follow the Master who leads them there. They don't want to go down the straight and narrow path. They'd rather make their fill in Vanity Fair. They would rather fill their life with pleasures of every kind and despise any difficulty because God would never want our lives to be difficult. Where do you find that? Anywhere in the Bible. Where do you find that anywhere in true church history? Where do you find that anywhere 
in the testimony of the perfect man. You don't. So do we face trial? Do we face difficulty? Are we overwhelmed? Sure. Then we lean to Christ more. We walk by faith more. We encourage one another more. Why? Because verse 10 tells us, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done, whether good or evil. All because... By faith we have been saved through grace. We are in Christ because of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But we must give an account, not for our salvation, for that is sealed, but for our activity following our salvation. For our activity in our life following that which we've been welcomed into the family. Now what are you going to do? Here is the distribution of the gifts. Yes, the Lord has moved upon our life and opened us to truth and helped us to have and receive the gift of the Spirit so that we might know truth in His Word. And here is the, the wonderful ways in which you can serve one another and serve the world around you. What are you going to do with them? What are the talents that we have that we are squandering and sitting on? And let us not forget that we will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Not the judgment seat that sends men and women to hell, but the one that distributes the rewards. The one that sends people on their way with the joys of a master that says, Well done, good and faithful servant. The judgment seat of Christ serves to keep us focused. Why? Because we're prone to wander. Aren't you thankful for good songs to sing with truth in them? Good thoughts that come from the Scripture so that we may walk in truth. And this powerful verse commends to us that we are to be focused on life here and now and living this life with the perspective of what does the Master want today? What does He have for me today? Not what do I want to do, not how can I fill, again, my life with every manner of my own earthly pleasures. Is earthly pleasures wrong? Not in their entirety, but they are wrong if when the balance is weighed, it is all pleasures and no work or faithfulness or fruitfulness. And what's funny is we would never put up with it in this life. We would never put up with people. We would never have compassion on someone that spends all their time in vacation and in, in pleasure seeking and everything else and no time in labor at all trying to take care of themselves and their family. Would we have grace and mercy on someone who, who makes a fool of their lives by doing everything contrary to common sense truth? And yet, people are, are content, spiritually speaking, oftentimes to, to be just this way. To not labor in the Word, to not labor in fellowship, to not labor in service. Did our Lord labor? He did. So don't be surprised when He calls upon His servants and His people to labor like Him and to be in fellowship like him, and to serve like him. I came not to be served, but to serve, and to give my ransom for many. And don't think that a servant is above his master. Case closed. It's closed. We're called to serve. We're called to walk faithful. We're called to what? Take up our cross and follow him. So the judgment seat of Christ, the bema seat of Christ, serves to focus us on heaven, to help us to see this life as it ought to be seen, as a mission field, that we are missionaries sent out locally and around the world so that we might be faithful in Christ. Think about it this way, though. It's important to see the good and the evil in context. It's not necessarily speaking of moral, morals. It's talking about the good things and the worthless things. What has been done to God's glory and what has been done for selfish intent? Again, it doesn't mean we can never have any pleasures in this life and we must always have our nose to the grindstone and we can never, ever enjoy anything this life has to offer. That's foolishness. God's given us a beautiful world and a wonderful life and great freedom and liberty. But where's the balance? What does our life look like? Where are we intentionally living in a way that says, how will God receive glory from my life today? How can I keep in the forefront of my mind as I walk by faith that His glory needs to be manifest in my life and how I interact with others and how I proclaim truth and how I live my life and how I endure difficult times and how I am found before His face or before His feet on my face as I pray and seek Him for His mercy and grace. We must live in light of eternity with God's glory and His pleasure in mind. Why? Because He gave it all so that we might live, so that we might be righteous in Christ, so that we might have 
true and everlasting life in a world that is a facade of that, in a world that pretends to have the fullness of pleasure, and yet their pleasures are fleeting, and they're full so many times of remorse and pain. But we as Christians have new life. We have, as Christians have new pursuits. We as Christians live for the pleasure of the King so that no matter what we do, in everything you do, Paul says, do it to the glory of God. So even in our pursuit of joy and of happiness and pleasures in this world and standing in awe of his creation and going and enjoying fellowship as a family and going and using the gifts that we have and unique hobbies, how wonderful is it to say this, even this is to God's glory because of his majesty. Moving on then, he moves now to the main thrust of our conversation this morning and our time together in the word, and that is the calling that we have, the calling of reconciliation, the calling to go into the world, the calling to make a difference. Paul begins this in verse 11 by saying, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Paul and his ministry partners lived ever mindful of the Lord who knows all things and will judge in righteousness. Therefore, they compelled everyone to come to Christ. We persuade others, including fellow believers, is who he's writing to here, to walk in truth, to put aside the sins that easily beset you, to come to faith, to walk in righteousness, and to do so in community because we stand in the fear of the Lord. Paul knew he would stand before the Lord one day and give an account, and he knows that we will too. And so in light of that, wouldn't it be foolish not to tell others? But in light of that truth, he, he can't help but tell others. We persuade others. We commend others to come to Christ, to live in Christ, to abide in Christ, to follow Christ, to walk with Christ, to grow in Christ. Christ, Christ, Christ. We're Christians. It's who we are. It's what we are. It's everything. It's our entire life now. We're no longer that. You'll see in a minute, the old things are gone. Put them away. Leave them packed away. Don't go back to them. New has come. Christ has come. And in him, we are in him, hidden in him. We live in him. We long for him. It's Christ. Hallelujah, the song says, all I have is Christ. Is it a song we sing or a life that we live? Not only to come, but likewise to live in light of the eternity that Paul has talked about. Here's the promise of eternal life. Here's the promise of the gift of an eternal body that we can't even fully understand, that will transcend time and space and last for eternity. So live in light of that. Live in light of those things. Invest in the future. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, the Lord Jesus said. Isn't it amazing? In his teaching, in his life, he restructured the thought. His truth challenged their way of thinking in their interactions with one another, in their worship of God, in the way they live their daily life. Why? Because the focus shifted from today, now, earthly things, pleasures at the moment, to that is what I'm looking for. He is who I'm living for, and that is why I am here now. My body hasn't fully wasted away because there's still a point for me to be here. Remember, the resurrection points to the second coming. And of that, we must cover and help be help of that. We must ever be mindful, rather, of our lives. The second coming should cause us to think in a fearful way, not in a scared way, but in a fearful way. The Lord of glory will come and will take me to himself, and I will stand before him and give an account of my life. And everything that is built, 1 Corinthians, everything that is built with wood, hay, and stubble will be burned away. And that which is built with precious stones, that which is built with worthly, worthwhile things will last forever. Don't we want to please the Lord of glory? Don't we want to be about his business? I have a hard time thinking that a genuine and true Christian who is walking in the truth could actually not care about that day. And say, well, you know, the Bible says I might make it and I'll smell a smoke. Are you really willing to risk that? Are you really willing to be there? Do you really want to find yourself there when the creator of all things, when every pleasure we have found fades away? What have you done, young man, young woman, child of mine with the gifts I have given you? Oh, I hid them away so I could do my own thing. I don't want to smell a smoke. 
I want to look more like him. The second coming is soon. Our lives must be lived in that manner. Do we live to pleasure the master, to please him? Are we living in the light of his soon return or even of our own impending death? Because if he doesn't return, if he does tarry, if he does continue to wait, then our lives will expire on this earth. And let's face it, we're not given a promise of this afternoon or tomorrow. So it doesn't matter our age. What are we doing with the moment we have now? Young person, don't waste your life. Elderly person, don't waste yours either. Every day is a gift from God. Every day we are called to this, to walk in courage, to be people who are about the reconciliation that's provided in Christ. Let us live in light of eternity as if we will forever be here on earth is foolishness because it's not true. We cannot live as though this is everything. Even though the world says, this is everything, live for this, live for this pleasure. Don't be caught up there. There is regret. There is difficulty. There is pain much greater than the sacrifice of following Christ. It might seem pleasing and pleasurable for the moment, but it is not, and it will certainly be not on that day when we look back and wonder, was that really worth it? Look at 12 and 13. Second half of 11, we'll read. But we are known to God, or what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known to you also. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause for boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. Now, this is historically important to understand Again, Paul wrote more than two letters. Paul labored in unbelievable tears, I'm sure, for the the church at Corinth because of the war that was for their souls there, the the difficulty that they faced, the, the, the leadership that crept in and tried to defame Christ and defame Paul and make little of him and exalt in their own abilities and exalt in their outward appearance. That's what he's talking about. But he says, what I am, what we are, is known to God. And I hope it's known to you also. He uses some great sarcasm in this this passage of Scripture, actually. Because he's giving direction and even discipline to the Corinthian people for following after fools who would seek to discredit him. And he says, look, I'm not commending myself again to you, but giving you cause to boast about us. Giving you reason to say, look, that's not true. You know, in our life, don't we have people that come to us and they say things about other people in in our circle of influence or friends or leaders that we know? And you you have to say, no, that's not true. That's not true. It's not true because I know that person. It's not true because I know his character or her character. It's not true, period. If they have evidence on the basis of two or three witnesses, then maybe so. But Paul's saying, look, what in the world are you even enduring this? The devil likes division. He wants to to thwart unity in the church. And he's discrediting the man who came to you in humility and in weakness. Didn't he say in the early parts of 1 Corinthians, I knew nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. I didn't come with oratory speech. I didn't come with wonderful abilities to stand and to make myself look great in your presence. No, I came in weakness. I came in all manner of other things. Why? Because I want you to know Christ and Him crucified in the power of the Spirit, not in the power of the person that stands behind here. Someone asked me this morning, are you ready? I said, for the second coming, because that's always the prayer before preaching. (laughs) But ultimately, I said this in my prayer this morning. I said, Lord, if I can just get up this morning and read your word, that's enough. Because it's your word that does the work. It's the Word of God that accomplishes all that God wants us to accomplish. It doesn't mean that we should only read our Bibles and leave. He has commended to us the teaching and instruction of the Word. He has called elders to be in that place to do this. But the Word of God is where the power is. And Paul knew that. It's not in the ability of the person that stands here. It's in the Holy Spirit who will work in the lives and the hearts of those in whom he works in. And Paul said, look, you're falling for charades. You're falling for the flashy things, the things that look good, the outward appearance, not what's in the heart. And the people that are all about their outward appearance, the people are all about the looks and the aesthetics and everything, they're that shallow most of the time. 
and they could care less about truth, and they will make excuses for truth. No, 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 we can't teach truth. We can't get there because, well, that's just not going to make the crowd we want. That's, that's just in, it's incongruent with the, 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 what we're trying to put out there, the, the look that we're trying to have in the community, the way we want to impact the world. Just, that's going to get in the way of our impact of the world, you know. I mean, after all, we can't have an Easter egg hunt if we... Whatever, just kidding. Not against Easter egg hunts. I promoted them for like the last three weeks on the radio. But the point is, Paul says, look, you're falling for the foolish things instead of coming to understand the truth of who I am and standing up for me. Stand up for me. He says this because here's some accusations. That guy's out of his mind. He is this. He's talking about these crazy things. So he said, look, if we're out of our mind, if we're beside ourselves, it's for God. I'm a fool for you. That's what he says. And if it's out, if we're in our right mind, it's for you. Whatever the accusation, I live, breathe, and move. Why? Because he goes back earlier to please him. So let them say what they're going to say. Let them do what they're going to do. But stand up for truth if you know the truth, when you know the truth. Don't let those stand in opposition. Because here's what Paul knew. Paul was fighting for the heart of the church. And he knew there was going to be those that would defect. He knew that those, there'd be those that would divide and move on. But he was speaking to the true saints of God, those who would maybe be in the, in the, in the difficulty of wavering, those who would be enduring the ear, the, 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 what is that called? The gossip and every other sort of thing that would come at them. And he's like, don't fall for that. Don't find yourself trapped in that area. Hold to truth. Hold to righteousness. It's important that we do so. And then it continues here in verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us urges us, compels us, empowers us. The love of Christ controls us. The love of Jesus demonstrated in his perfect life, his sacrificial death and glorious resurrection compels or urges the believer to greater service. Paul says, this is why I live and move and breathe and do what I do. I mean, think Paul could easily have been one of the most popular, if not the most popular Pharisee to ever walk the earth. He was gifted in all kinds of ways, but he said, look, all that is rubbish for knowing Christ. All that is nothing to me. I'm willing to do all the things and more of what he suffered in 2 Corinthians 6 and in other places. Why? Because of the love of Christ, the love of my Savior, that he would come and live that perfect life, that he would die on Calvary's cross as an atonement for my sin, and that he is raised again and guarantees my resurrection as well. Christ came to serve and to save, and in like manner, the redeemed of Christ are people who serve in his behalf. Do we think about our lives that way? Do we think about the way in which we live, that it's me today, I'm serving in behalf of Christ? I'm ministering in behalf of Christ? I'm the light of the world because the light of the world has shone into me? I'm reflecting his glory But he continues, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, that those who, might, who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake was raised. This passage does not in any way constitute universalism because the entirety of Scripture argues for the truth that what it teaches is that Christ died for those who put their faith in him. He substituted himself in their place. In the place of God's elect, Jesus died. And so also those who are in Christ from before the foundations of the world, but those who are in Christ today and in the days ahead, we have died and we are hidden with Christ. We are united with Christ in his death and in his resurrection we died and we were raised spiritually to new life in Him. And we no longer live for ourselves, but live for Christ and for His sake. The death and resurrection of Christ is the gateway by which we are made new creatures. That we are made new creations and we walk in a renewed life. We're given new and eternal life now. And we are given a new calling and a purpose in this life. Eternal life is already ours. Again, as Pastor Mitch mentioned last week, but Ephesians 2.10 tells us why we still are here. 
because he's created us to be good workmen, faithful in all of his works that he has planned for us, that he has made for us. Now, there's much more that could be said, but for the, lack, for the lack of time this morning, we can't get into all the details of 14 and 15. But it is important for us to recognize that it is not advocating that everybody on earth has been saved by Christ. We know that's not true. But for all who will place their faith in Christ, and we don't know who the all is, so we go and compel all. What does it say? We persuade others. So we compel all to come in. Does not Jesus say, thank you, Father, that you have not, you've hidden these things from the wise and the learned, and that you have revealed them to babes, you revealed them to small. What he's doing, he's talking about his electing love right there, and then he follows it up by saying, now, if any of you are weak and heavy laden, you're weary, you're overwhelmed, come to me, and I will give you rest. Come to me, take my yoke upon you. Christ welcomes and we welcome all who will put their faith in Christ because I don't know and you don't know who the Holy Spirit is working in. And that is so marvelous because the next verse challenges us to think even deeper about the way which we live that evangelistic call out. The empty tomb beckons us to new life, full of service to Christ and to one another, living in the Lord, loving God rightly and following his way. But look at verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no more. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ was a watershed event because from that point on, men and women are divided not by gender, not by ethnicity, not by any other division but by relationship to Jesus Christ in a saving way or in a damning way, in one that's going to send them to eternal life in heaven or one that is going to curse them to hell forever. That is the dividing line. And Paul says, look, from now on, as a result of this, as a result of the love of Christ and the work of Christ and the resurrection of Christ, I do not look at anyone based upon fleshly measurements. And think about it, when you fill out forms, you've got a thousand different things to check out. This, 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 this. That's a good thing. You know, it works out in different ways in order to categorize this correctly. Here's the categories. Saved, unsaved. Lost, saved. Reached, unreached. So Paul is actively working to reach the unle unreached, to compel those to come in, to encourage those who are in Christ. Jesus changes everything for everyone. Because of him, people come to faith in his finished, accomplished work of salvation and are eternally saved. Or, as Paul said in another passage, we are the fragrance of death to them, so they perish to an eternal hell where the fury of God's wrath will be poured out on them. And that's why he says, one has died for all, therefore all have died. They have either died in Christ or they will suffer and die forever in hell. One of the two places. There is no other option. And for the Christian to shy away from the truth of that, because we're somehow ashamed of truth. We don't need to be ashamed of truth. Why? It's God's truth. Which is why Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it's the power of God unto salvation for who? Those who believe. So Paul says, Therefore, I don't regard anyone according to the flesh. I don't care where you're from. I don't care what you do. I don't care what your story is. The whole world looks at these things. What is your heritage? What is your family history? What is your value? What is your worth? What's your bank account look like? What's your nationality? How well are you doing things? Do you have good financial status? The list goes on and on and on. But for the child of Christ, banish the thought and be rid of the Issues that we have when we meet other people and immediately every form of ism comes into our minds. How can I just get rid of this person? How can I disqualify this person from my life right now? If God brings the person into our lives, how are we interacting with them? How are we seeing them? How are we working for Christ's glory in their life? Paul's concern and ours too, by virtue of our union with Christ, is for souls, souls, souls. Indeed, Christ has made us fishers of men. We want to go and reach the lost. 
The work of Christ compels the follower of Christ to evangelism. And it encourages us and it fills us with passion and with courageous zeal for truth. Let's face it. Sometimes we, we meet someone for the first time or we interact with someone for the first time. And, and if you're like me, I'm a little bit timid of that. I've said before, I'm not, a, I'm not a cold caller. I'm a people person once I meet you. Everything's great. But getting to that point, it's like, uh. And so I'm not, I'm not sure I'm ever ashamed of Jesus, but I'm scared to death to talk to the person. So I can't even get to Jesus because I'm scared to death to talk to the person half the time. That's why you have McKenzie Crossman's in your life. You send them to go do it. Mac's not afraid to do one. <clears throat> but the point is, we, we can't regard people. We can't discriminate against them in worldly ways. We must focus on truth in their lives. So let's move on here. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. We all once perceived Christ from an earthly, non-believing perspective. And the Apostle Paul has his story written for us. What, aren't you glad yours isn't? <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. Aren't you glad that our life, you know, someone said, well, yeah, men wrote the Bible. Yeah, they did. And my little Levi could tell you that they were moved upon by the Holy Spirit and instructed and guided in all that they wrote so that the word of God could be complete. But the Holy Spirit included some interesting things that those men trying to uh, create a new religion wouldn't have worked out. Paul's life was on display in, a, in the writing of Luke. Paul persecuted the church in his zeal to combat Christ. He hated Christ. He hated everything about Christianity. He threw them in jail. He had them killed. He held the cloak of those who would stone Stephen. And just as Paul was given spiritual eyes to see and behold Christ on the Damascus Road, so too we have been enlightened to the glory of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We once regarded him according to the flesh. We don't anymore. We don't anymore. And I'm thankful for that. That God will use a person like Paul, who was Saul, and all his story to bring glory to himself. But you know, sometimes the glory of that is missed in, in that we only see Paul, we only see Peter, we only see the things. But what about, what about everyday life? Have we not witnessed those who have come to Christ? Have we not went to witnessed those that when someone we knew and loved comes to Christ, everything changes? The way they saw him, the way they interacted with him, the way that they were combative, or the way that they were just indecisive changes completely. We care not for where the person has come from, so long as they come to Christ. This is why we go into all the world and preach the gospel. Whether you're in the jungles of Papua New Guinea, or the dirt and dusty hut roads of Zambia, or Daytona Beach, or New York, or wherever. Wherever you've come from, come to Christ. Come to Christ. Our hearts must be born and burdened and burn with compassion and evangelistic zeal, unless in fact we are indeed looking at others through physical and worldly eyes only. Sometimes I'm, I fear that the evangelistic zeal which I have or don't have is based on that. How am I living out that principle today? How am I walking in truth today? How am I viewing others? Are they just an inconvenience because of their physical things? Or because they're a human being on this earth created in the image of God, and valuable, are they worth my time and my sacrifice and my tears and my service? They were to Jesus. And many of those same people were the same ones that rejected him later. So we might not reach all for Christ. Certainly we won't. But will we reach all for Christ? Because we're compelled to. Ephesians 2 shows us that Christ has destroyed every barrier. I love that passage. Titus 2 also commends to us the same thing, that through the work of Christ, the grace of Christ has come, and it has made available salvation for all the people groups of the world. And we're to go. All right, moving quickly here, 17 and 18. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And here is the final thrust of what do we do as a result of the cross of Christ. Verses, or verse 17 completes the thought of 14, 15, 
16 and 17, and therefore can be translated so. So, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. We don't regard them from a worldly viewpoint, but from a spiritually one. The old things are gone, done away with, and the new has come. The new creation in Christ is non-negotiable. It's not a maybe. It's a certainty. If they are in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, then he is a new creation. I once met a youth pastor one time, and we were in a Q&A session with him, and he had served in youth ministry for a long, long time, and someone asked him, you know, what, what would you do differently? He said, I would be careful of the assurance I gave them. And since then, he has moved to if-then statements. If this is true about your life, then this is true. And he said, not because I don't want to give anybody assurance, but I want them to think and to see, is this true? If I'm in Christ, then I'm a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have come, become new. Hence the reason Paul contrasts the old life and the new life in Ephesians and Colossians and in other places. These aren't suggestions. They're true and genuine character traits. This is how you used to live. This is how the world lives. Don't do that anymore. Flee from that. Lean upon the Holy Spirit. Trust in the work of the Lord. Love the truth. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Not by sitting there going, I really want to do what's right. No. Fill your heart and your mind with truth, and the truth will begin to work in you by the work of the Holy Spirit, and it will begin to walk itself out in your life. I feel so many times that people find themselves in defeated situations and difficult moments. And ultimately, it's because they're not walking in truth. They're not walking in the way of truth. It doesn't mean every difficulty is, is only a result of, of us disobeying. It's certainly not the case. But the reality is we need to walk in truth. Put to death, Paul says in Colossians, the old ways, the old things. They're not welcome anymore. Why? Because they were nailed to the cross of Christ. When the activity and the temptation comes, when the opportunity to do what we used to do, when the opportunity comes to do which we know is wrong, what should we say? That was nailed to the cross. That was what Christ went to the cross for. Why would I dive into that again? Why would I go there again? And as one pastor says, crucify him afresh. How foolish. When we walk in our old ways, sinful ways, we profane Jesus. Our life matters now because of what he's done and because of the second coming and because, as Paul said, the judgment seat of Christ is on its way surely. He is the creator of new life, new creation. Colossians 3 says the new man is being formed in the image and likeness of his creator. And Paul says you're complete in Christ. You're full in Christ. Walk in Christ. Therefore, put away these things and put on these things. Put off the old man, put on the new. Through Jesus, we are drawn into new things, righteous things, things that belong to God, things that are right. And then he says, all this is from God. Everything that is accomplished is from God. The love of Christ is from God. The work of salvation is from from God. The new creation is from God. The fact that we can see people rightly through Christ's eyes and with his compassion is from God. And why? And who is this God? Who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. God's sovereign work is on display and all is for his glory and all is for his purposes. God is the author and the accomplisher of reconciliation as the Bible tells us, we were dead in our sins and trespasses, but God, in his love, made us alive together with who? With Christ. With Christ. And he's done something. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. Where, does the, where do we go from the peaks of the resurrection? We go to the, to the paths of ministry and reconciliation being our primary goal. Reconciliation being our primary goal. The gospel of Christ being our primary goal. Other things secondary to that. So many times today we find people exalting other ministry efforts, other felt need efforts, other things that are very true and very needy and very important, but they cannot be above the gospel or the gospel goes away. And you're just another social club helping a group of people. Man loves to help people so many times because it somehow makes him feel better about himself. But physical help does not reconcile anyone to God. No one, period. It doesn't. 
The gospel reconciles them to God or the gospel eliminates them and moves them on because they have rejected Christ. The gospel is not weak in saving them. Their rejection, their unbelief, their hatred for Christ seals their fate. In Christ, it says in verse 19, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Obviously, we have to see this in light of the historical effort that Paul and Peter and James and John, and all those who went first, those apostles who laid the foundation, but we build upon Christ. That's why Paul said there can be nothing else laid except Jesus, and on that you build, and you build with truth. Entrusted ministers and ambassadors of Christ. This verse 20. Oh, what a verse. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Make God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. Entrusted ministers and the body of Christ going as ambassadors of the gospel of peace. Again, Ephesians 6 tells us that when it talks about the armor of the Lord being prepared, our feet prepared and ready with the gospel of peace to go and to take it, to be ambassadors for Christ. Here is the good news of great joy that we are sent as personal messengers of Jesus Christ and God himself is working through us. Isn't it amazing that when you go through life and you come up against someone who might be a believer and you're ministering to them or who might be a lost person and you are seeking to bring the message of truth to them, that it is God working in you and me to draw them to himself, that it is God making his appeal. Why? Because it's not my message, it's his that's why we can't change the message. And those who do change the message and alter the message are heretics and do not count for the kingdom's work. It's his message. It's his gospel. It's his truth. And so Paul says, we're ambassadors. God is working through us. And so let us appeal to you. Let us implore you. Let us beg you. Be reconciled to God. Here's the personal and direct invitation. Come to Christ. Where do we go from the peaks of resurrection? To the masses to say, come to Christ. To the people to say, come to Christ. To those who wonder why we come to church on Sunday. Why don't we just lay around or go to the beach? I mean, after all, it's springtime, summer's coming. It's a great time to relax and to fill ourselves with all manner of earthly pleasures. Oh, no. Why would I have that temporary pleasure instead of the fellowship, the instruction, and the beauty that is the local church of Jesus Christ? Why? He's building his church. I want to be part of that. God has sent us out, and he has called us to go. God sends out the call, and sinners respond, yes or no, accept or reject. And we go and compel them to come in, receive Christ, come to Christ, knowing the difficulty might come. Paul faced it. But where difficulty might come, where rejection might come, where the darkness might hate the light, there will be those that God works in their hearts and in their lives. There will be those that he draws to himself. There will be those that he brings to himself. And you are a reflection of that today because someone, whether your parents when you were little or someone in your life through your days, brought the message of Christ to you and said, come to Christ. I'm an ambassador of Jesus Christ. I've got this wonderful news, this great news that you can be reconciled to God, that your sin debt can be paid. And here's the power behind it, verse 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. Our sin was reckoned to Christ, and he suffered as a substitute, the only ultimate substitute. Nothing else counts. Nothing else matters. And his, reckon, his righteousness, his perfection then, was reckoned to us. All of our evil, all of our sin, reckoned to him. And all of his perfection given to us. And we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Resurrection demands that we, those who have been saved by grace, be the messengers of hope and the ambassadors of reconciliation. Pastor Mitch said last week the resurrection pointed to the second coming, and it does. Jesus is coming. And as verse 10 of this chapter said, we will all stand before him and give an account. And we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. What have you done with the ministry that I've given you? Jesus will say. Let us live as new creations, focused on Christ, captured by his saving grace, and passionate about growing in grace and truth and with one another. 
instruction, fellowship, service, those three things being prime in our focus. This is where we go from Easter Sunday. Every day filled with purpose. No matter the age of our bodies, we have work to do. Our heavenly bodies are prepared for us. God has already prepared them in the time of past, and they are ready and waiting for us when he calls us home and when he brings a final consummation to all things. So where do we go? We go to the mission field. What are we? We're ambassadors for Christ. And we will stand before our Lord. So let's be found faithful. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning and for your word. And I personally thank you for your grace. Lord, for the truth of this, that there's nothing to fear, that there's nothing to stand and wonder about as to say, well, I don't know what to do. Oh, we, we know what to do. Oh, we know what to do. We follow him. We abide in him. We come to him. We, we fellowship with him. We are as Mary. We sit at his feet and are instructed. We love one another. We love God rightly because of the Holy Spirit's work in us. And we come to the word of God, which is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that we might be prepared and ready and matured and useful in Christ's mighty hand. Lord, I fear that so many times we we, we, we see other things as more valuable than this. And I confess, oh Lord, my laziness at times when it comes to these things. Help us, Lord. Give us grace to walk in truth. And might we see the harvest. Send us out. Send us out as laborers into the harvest because we have the message. We have the truth. Give us boldness and give us a harvest. That's what we pray for is a harvest, Lord, that many would come, not only this building, but all through this land and through this world as we go and we go and we call and we compel. Help us, Lord, we pray. And it's in Jesus' name that we thank you for these things, that we rejoice in these things, and we desire to walk in these things in obedience. Amen.